So as we get ready for our series, you are here. If I could have two people, there's one willing volunteer. Everybody needs one of those. And there are less of these. However, um, those are sheets that, you know, if you're in a couple, if you're together with someone here, uh, <clears throat> you may want uh, to share. These sheets that have uh, fellowship on and scripture verses and the three points for today, everybody should have one of those so you can get a pen out, a pencil. I know there's pens over there. If you don't have one, take a moment and grab that and um, you can make yourself notes as we go through this whole entire series. Uh, there'll be these type of sheets uh, for you to utilize. In the series you are here, we're going to specifically stay in the fourth chapter of Mark. And the fourth chapter of Mark, primarily there is a parable within it that is, as you will discover as we look into God's Word, one of the most important parables that Jesus spoke of, and to understand where you are in your Christian journey, and to understand how you get from where you are to the next place, it's really important to understand how Jesus lays that out in the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. You're also going to find this same parable in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 13, and you'll find it again in Luke in chapter 8. Each uh, gospel writer, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three write about this time when Jesus is teaching. So, if everybody has one of these, feel free to make notes on it. You can even copy my little goofy diagram that I'm going to draw up here on the board at some point. Uh, this page here, this is the double-sided page. How many people in here are in a life group? Me either. Okay, if you're not in a life group, I want to take a minute and explain why did I pass this out. I'm going to explain to you why I passed this out. Life groups are the place where people do life together. That means they talk about Jesus. They interact with each other, maybe fellowship-wise. They talk to each other. They pray for each other. They get together midweek either every week or every other week, and they do life together. And in the process of doing life together, this is a pretty good example if you're not in a life group, or maybe you've been thinking about leading a life group, because I know there's lots of people in here thinking about leading a life group. It is honestly the best way to attract new people into the faith, into the thing that we believe in, this Jesus, than anything else out there today. Because people want to be connected. They want to be connected. They want to be connected to God. Most of them don't know how to be connected to God. And so you have the answer on how to be connected to God. Then you need to connect with people that aren't connected to God. Make sense? And you can do that in a life group. And this is really going to give you a synopsis of how you could, as a leader, lead your life group. It gives you every single thing you could possibly need. The questions. The framework for anything you could want to discuss at your life group. And I think that's the fundamentally the, the best way to engage in life groups is to take what God brings, the pastors here, have them put sheets like this together that are discussion sheets that lead the person right through the whole process and take that into the week and talk about it even more than what we're going to talk about uh, that subject here this morning. So, this parable that Jesus told, I believe, is one of the ones that we need to understand on how we look at the Christian life as a journey, right? Because it, how many of you agree that it's not a destination? Like, we don't just get to a destination and then we're there. We don't just arrive. Has, if anybody in here, has anybody arrived at Jesus-like qualities at 100% in the room? Anybody? Just in case I'm speaking to anybody, maybe Jesus is here, I don't know it. Just, I would like to know now if anybody has arrived at that destination. Okay, good. That's great. So, as you can see up here, for those of you who can't see, 
and the graphics are a map with that big you are here sign. How many of you have been to a place, let's just say like an amusement park? Who goes to amusement parks? Okay. Now, when I go to Kennywood because my wife is a Kennywood freak, okay, she's such a Kennywood freak, I got engaged at Kennywood. Okay, I asked her to marry me at Kennywood on the carousel, and we know which horse it was that I asked her to marry her on. And when that merry-go-round goes out of business, my mission is to get that horse for our house. <laughs> Just saying, that's how much time during the summer that potentially I could spend at Kennywood. Okay, I'm not crazy about amusement parks. I could care less. I eat all day, and I watch kids all day. One place I don't need the map, you know the big map when you walk into an amusement park, you walk into a big place, one of the first things you go to is that map that tells you where you are. But see, the greatest thing about that map isn't that it tells you where you are. The greatest thing about that map is you have a destination you probably want to get to. So that map tells you how to get to that destination. And that's what this parable is going to outline for us. How It's going to show you and reveal to you where you are, and it's gonna, I'm going to give you practical steps based on information in the Bible on how do you get to that next place to get to the next destination. And fundamentally, there's a battle inside this parable that you'll see that's the battle that we all fight. That's the battle against Satan and his evil influence in the world to keep us from getting to our intended destination. There's a real enemy that is really trying to keep you from getting from where you are to where God wants you to be. And I'll explain that later. Now, interestingly enough, about this series, back in 2007, there was a big survey done of about 525 churches or so, 180,000 people, and these people were all people that were going to church in some way, shape, or form. Not saying they were there every week, it's just, it was a holistic survey of people that were on some level already attending church. Now this survey was done specifically to reveal, which is why it was called a reveal, the reveal survey. It was done to reveal how well is the church doing at teaching and discipling people through the process of people who are far from God, people who are in the initial stages of coming to church, all the way through being God-centered people. That's what the purpose of the study was. Now, that study helped, uh, helped the church and church leaders understand the movement and groups that people go through in their Christian life in church, okay? And let me lay this out for you and help you understand it better. What we're going to actually talk about specifically today is we're going to set up the whole series. And you're going to have to pardon my artistic work, okay? But it's really going to help if I lay this out this way. It's going to help everybody. So as I'm laying this out, there are four groups of people. Now, that's not to label anybody. That's just to say that this study revealed to pastors and church leaders four specific places and four specific levels that people go through in their Christian lifetime. The interesting thing about it is it not only revealed the groups of people, but it also revealed how people get and what the catalyst was to get people from where they were into that next group. So the way we're going to lay this out in groups is we're going to call the first group EG. I don't know if I have that next slide up there. These are people that are exploring God. Okay. These are people that are beginning in God. These people here are close to God. And these people here in this group are what we call God-centered. Now here's the interesting part about this. Okay? 
So you have people that are exploring God, people that are beginning in God, people that are close to God, and people that are God-centered. Right here is where we put... Anybody know what I'm drawing? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Cyprus, I love you. I love you even more. You got the right answer. So I'm putting the cross, and this is an important place, and this is an important diagram for everyone to understand. Now please understand, as I preach this, I already know that there are people in every group amongst us here right now today. It is not important, nor should it be at all. You sure? It shouldn't be an issue as to where you find yourself. Because some of you may be God-centered people, and you may be driven to be uh, what we call lordship, the lordship of your life. You're in Christ. You've been a Christian for a very, very long time. So that's how the basic journey lays itself out. Uh, and how we're going to look at this, is that better? All right then, so I just have to get on my knees now to write, but that's okay. <laughs> so, thank you. So how this looks, as far as our series goes, is these people here, okay, are what we call people that are experiencing fellowship. And this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to get to that here very shortly. People in the Exploring God group are in a fellowship stage. People that are in the beginning in God are in the relationship stage. Okay? People in the close to God circle are in the disciple ship stage, and these folks in this last group, God-centered people, are in what we call lordship stage. Okay? Here's the interesting thing. Whatever group you are in, and whatever group you find yourself in, you automatically already know people in all the other groups. You automatically know, as you sit here right now, people in other groups that correspond to what we have as a diagram here this morning. So, what we also want to make sure we understand, that no matter where you are in this, as we discuss it, as we read our parable here in a moment, I want to make sure that you all understand that over top of all of this, whole entire process, we are all... Does anybody know what I'm writing? Thank you. We are all growing in every stage. And I would, sug I would suggest to you that if you find yourself here, the people that find themselves here that are, that are lordship, Jesus is, uh, I'm going to get to how we define that and what that looks like here as we move through. The biggest problem that we have is people in this category that fall backwards and backslide back down into the first, in, in, into this bubble here and waver around. And there's a lot of different ways that that can happen. And I've seen it and it's sad, but if you're not continuing to grow, just because you might be in this last category and you're a God-centered follower of Jesus Christ doesn't mean you're not continuing to grow into the likeness of Jesus, into the likeness of the Savior. That's not what that means. All these things and all these places, none of us have arrived at. But it gives us a good framework for us as a people of God to understand, well, if I am, if God is the Lord of my life and I'm a God-centered person, guess what? I have a newsflash for you maybe that you haven't thought about. You're responsible to all the other groups of people. 
See, the people in this group that are exploring God, they're not responsible to the God-centered people. But the God-centered, lordship-driven people, they're responsible to help all of the other groups of people make their way through that process. And I think a lot of times, Christians have forgotten that that's the case. They get to a place, they think they've arrived, and that's their destination, and that's it. And a lot of times, that makes itself manifest in, I go to church, I check off my box, I send in my money, don't bug me. You get where I'm going with this? Jesus is very clear in this parable, and we're going to read that right now. Let's start off by reading Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. If you have a Bible, turn there. Or you can look up on the screen, and you should be able to, uh, to see it there as well. This is Jesus speaking, and he says in verse 1, Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lakeshore. It's possible, based on historical accounts, that this parable that he teaches, this set of parables that you see, Jesus has the largest crowd that he's ever had any time he's ever spoke because there was so many people that he had to leave the shore because they crowded him to the water and get in a boat, and he's teaching the people as they're gathered all over the lake shore and the mountainside from a boat out on the water. That's, that's how many people were there that he's crowded out and has to go in a boat to speak to them. So he began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him. So he ended up getting into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling them many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even a 100 times as much as had been planted. Then he said, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Now, how many of you that have been in church for any length of time in verse 9 have heard that so many times? Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. You've heard that. Have you ever really, you know, if you're a new person or if you're in this exploring group, you might hear that and go, well, I guess that means maybe that there were people in the group that didn't have any ears, so they couldn't hear. Okay? Jesus by this statement, specifically ends this parable by saying that he's speaking in spiritual terminology. So it's important for us to do a couple word studies as we look at this, as well as, because it's going to help us understand what is Jesus saying, okay? And what he's saying, and what we have to understand here, is we have to understand that the Bible is a spiritual book. Okay, written by a spiritual being to spiritual beings. So when you look at verse 10, or you look at some corresponding verses, he's trying to say those people that have ears to hear, those people whose ears are opened, that can understand the mysteries of God, that are going to understand what I'm saying, please hear what I'm saying. There are among them people who are not going to hear anything that he says because they do not have the ability spiritually to receive it from him because they don't have any inclination to listen. And I want you to understand that the one group of people that we've left off of this particular chart specifically and on purpose is this group of people who are out here, and I call this group the FFG group, which we're not going to talk about, which this series does not talk about. And the FFG group are 
who has figured it out. People that are far from God, that could care less about God, that are people that the Spirit is working on, but for them to hear anything that God is saying from a spiritual dimension or a spiritual nature, they have to get into this position for God to be able to speak to them. And that's what Jesus is saying by what he means in verse 9. So I want to make that clear so you understand. Even in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you'll read it, you'll see that Paul says, the natural mind cannot understand the things of God until that mind is changed and drawn by Christ. Okay? So, he says to them, verse 10 through 13, When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? This is a problem. This is a problem because what Jesus says here is really important for all of us here today. And there must be something so important about this parable that what he's communicating is that if you don't understand this parable, guys, how are you going to understand anything else I tell you? Because what Jesus did was speak in parables. And I would venture to say that what this parable shows us more than anything else isn't anything other than how the enemy attacks us and derails us from our Christian journey. I, I really have to say that as many times as I've read it, as many times as I've gone over it, I have not seen it the way that I've seen it as I have writing this particular message. So let's take a look further down in the parable, and let me help you understand. You might This is a place where you might want to make some notes, okay? So verse 14, let's jump down to verse 14, because this is where Jesus explains the parable in deeper detail. He says, The farmer, or the sower in some versions, plants the seed by taking God's word to others. Okay, here's the first group, exploring God group. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message, only to have Satan come at once and take it away. That's group one. That's exploring God, folks. Here's group two, the beginning in God people. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and have immediately received it. They've immediately received it. Okay, these people hear the message. Satan comes immediately and snatches it out away. The second group of people, they've heard the message. They've received the message, which means they received it and done something with it, is what Jesus is saying. And he continues to say, people that immediately receive it, they receive it with joy. How many of you were joyous when you got saved? Were you happy? Or was it like the most miserable day in your life? Probably not. People that receive salvation receive it with joy and thanksgiving, right? But since they don't have deep roots, don't have deep roots yet, they don't last long. You ever notice people? How many times have we all been together? Whether it's in our own discipleship groups, man, what happened to this person? This person got saved. They were on fire for Jesus. They, they, were, they were doing so well. And then all of a sudden you start not to see them. You don't even you try to follow up with them later on down the road. And this is who Jesus is talking about, this second group of folks, these people that are beginning in God. And what happens? They don't have deep roots, so they don't last long. They fall away as soon as what? As soon as a problem or a persecution comes along for believing the word and have received it, they lose and Satan steals it from them. People that are close to God, people that are in the process of discipleship, is the next group. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, the desire for other things. So what happens is no fruit is produced in this group. How many of you feel or have felt like you've been so close to God, but all of the things of life have so overwhelmed you that you're not producing anything significant in your life? You just feel like, I don't know. I, I, I'll put my hand up because I've been there, and I've been there, and I'm sure you have too. In the last group, I want to mention something here. It says, 
Quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of life, the lure of wealth, desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. In some, it says, they fall away. In some versions, it says, so that they stumble. I personally believe the right translation is stumble because I don't believe people in this group have fallen away or lost their salvation. Anybody can get in, run into something in life and stumble, right? If I walk across the floor and Sam sticks her foot out and tries to trip me, which Satan's going to try to do, I'm going to stumble. Stumbling and falling away are two different things. Okay, I want to make that clear. And the last group, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planned. Make a note on the groups as we talk about them. There's an interesting word here back up in the beginning of this story called parable. Does everybody know what a parable actually is? Because Jesus, if you want to understand the deeper things of God, one of the things that I have to encourage you to do is really understand when Jesus is telling stories, when he's giving truth, he does it in the form of a parable. So parable is a Greek word. Para, prefix, bole. Okay? Para, bole. That's how it's said in Greek. Okay? We don't say it that way in America, but that's how it's actually pronounced. Parabole. That's, what it, that's how you say it. What does that mean? That means para means alongside. Sam, come here. Yeah, you're my object lesson person for the day. Okay. Alongside. So stand over here. Okay. Para means alongside. And bole, soccer fans, you ought to know what bole means. Bole means to throw. So when Jesus speaks in parables, what he's doing is telling a story, okay, and he's throwing alongside a truth or a principle to go along with it. Get it? Parabole, parable. So he's telling a story. You're good. He's telling a story, and he's throwing a truth alongside it to help bring a principle to life for us to understand. There's also another word that we hear called para, parakletos. We say paraclete, that's wrong. It's parakletos in the Greek. And that refers to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is that person who wants to do what, Sam? you just got to go with me. Come back. It's okay. Come back up here. You said I was done. Oh, just for a moment. So the Holy Spirit that's going to work in this whole series is the parakletos. And the parakletos wants to be your friend and walk alongside you, leading you and guiding you into all truth. So you can just walk right around and go back and sit down. Okay? So when you hear those terms, I want you to understand uh, what, what we're saying and what we're talking about and why is Jesus doing what he's doing. And I, I really what I'm trying to do is hopefully excite you about reading the Bible. How many people like to read? Like they, You just like to read. I'm not talking about you like to pick up your Bible specifically. I'm just saying you're a reader. You like to read. You like mystery. You like trying to figure things out. Then get into this book. Get in here. The, the most amazing things, Jesus talks about the most amazing things, and the Holy Spirit who wants to walk alongside you to help you understand it, to open your eyes, to move you through this process, wants to enlighten things. I see things in parables all the time when I study and read that I didn't see two years ago. I did a message like this two years ago, and I pulled it back up, and I looked at it, and I went, wow, that's awful. That is the most awful sermon I've ever read. And I wrote it two years ago. And it's funny how you can look backwards. And I was in a different place two years ago. I was probably in a different place maybe on that journey, maybe when I wrote it. I don't know. I'm just being honest. And if we're all real honest, we'll figure out where we are and try to get to the next place. Now, let's talk about this first group um, that is exploring God, and they are fellowshipping, all right? And there are, there are certainly pitfalls to each one. 
But here's what I want us to understand. Yes, we're all growing, right? We all agree. So we're on the process of growing, and let's talk a little bit about the movements um, that people, this survey, let's go back to that for a minute. It helped us understand some very important things that we all need to understand, okay, to get from place to place. There's an essential truth that people in the first group understood to get them to the next group. And the essential thing that they understood to get here was was grace. They understood the truth that Jesus reveals in Scripture, that God reveals, which is called grace. That's how you move through the cross. You in this group, if you're in this group, you might be asking a lot of questions. And the biggest fundamental thing that people understand that gets them into this beginning stage in their Christian journey is they didn't do anything to deserve it. And I know for a lot of you this is fundamental, but I want you to understand this so clearly because it is so important that no matter where we are on this journey, it all comes back to this principle right here. Because it all started with grace. And it all ends with grace. And through the whole process, it has to be covered with grace. I think a lot of times what we do and what Satan does is try to get people stuck in the fruitless, non-productive idea of works. That somehow you got to do something to get Jesus to love you enough to move to that next place where you're saved. Friends, I can't tell you how damaging that thought process is, and I can honestly tell you, and I know because there are people in this room right now, that the church has made it ridiculously hard to understand what God has made ridiculously simple. You could be anywhere on your journey, and the covenant that you people here make with me forever until Jesus comes back or I die or you die, is that you never make this hard. Never make hard what God made simple. God made this, he took the most complicated philosophy of all other philosophies, the problem of human sin. Okay, none of us could solve that problem. Who's going to give me an amen? Amen. You and I can't solve that problem. That's philosophically impossible for the human being to do. God took that complicated problem, wrapped it in flesh and blood and bones, sent it here, and fixed the problem. And the only thing required was what? Well, we read this in the very, very beginning. The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to other. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. Interesting. The people in this group are people that are coming to church. They're exploring God. They're asking questions. Okay? They may not be over here where you are, and these people we want to minister to. These are people you want in the family. But they're stuck in this place. Well, what did Jesus say about the wages of sin? What's a wage? Something you get. So if works was the right way to heaven, what are you going to get paid? Based on John chapter 6, what are you going to get paid if works is the right way to get to, to eternal life? You're going to get death because the wages of sin is death, right? So I think a lot of people think that Jesus just put a down payment on their salvation and now... Once you receive it and you're over here, now you have to work it off. The biggest problem with these people over here is they get caught back into this whole works ideology where they now got to do something to continue for God to love them and be saved, and it all turns into works righteousness. That's completely opposite of what's being said in the Bible. So you're aware of that. Now,
I don't think that as you read this, that God is specifically talking so much about bad people. Okay, I used to think when I read this at first, and please chime in here, that, well, there are three bad people and one good person in the story, okay? How many of you thought that when you read it? Well, there's three bad people because they, they end up off the path, and there's only really one good one that produces any fruit. As I read and reread this and studied it, that's not the case. There are four different people, if you want to say there are four different people. Some scholars believe that this is actually talking about one person in four different phases of their life. You can think about that either way. But the way I want you to understand this parable is not about bad people and one good person, because that has nothing to really do with it. There are people that God is speaking to in this parable, right? So or so is the word. Seeds are going out. The word is being spoken, right? Everything is happening the way God wants it to. The problem in this parable is the enemy who comes in to take it away. Now, how many of you believe that the word that's planted in you today, after you leave, Satan can come and steal it away? Do you believe that? Do you? Well, I know why you believe it, because it says it right here. Right? It's pretty plain. Nothing happens before I get the car. <laughs> Thank you. And he said sometimes it happens before he gets to the car. Now, have you ever thought about the process that we use in church to follow up on people, people that are new, people that are in this group? If Satan's following up with them as soon as they get out the door, why aren't we? Because the Word can't keep watered and where it's supposed to be if other people, us Christians, you see how there's a two part? There's parts to this. There's a human part and a divine part. So we need to be following up with these people. People that experience this or people that are here to help them get here, they have to keep that word in their heart. He can come and steal it away. The Bible tells us to do what with our heart? Guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Everything comes out of your heart. So if Satan can come into your heart and steal the word, as soon as you leave or before you get to the car, then that means we have a pretty important job to do as believers, don't you think? Follow up with people, encourage people, pray with people, all those different things. Now, <clears throat> let's move on and get to one other thing before we go through these three points, because these three points are simple and they won't take long. Um, the three points that if you're in this group are something that you really need to understand. This is how you get from this group to this group. So these people are people that are beginning their life with God. They're beginning their Christian journey. They've understood grace. They've got the concept. These folks here, interestingly enough, to move from this group to this group, have clearly understood something that has gotten them there. God's Word. God's Word. They've understood God's Word and have started to make... God's Word, the very foundation of everything in their life. So when you get here, yeah, trouble comes. Yeah, worries come. Anybody ever have that experience where you have somebody who's, who's new in Christ, who's beginning their life with God, and they run into a tragedy, a life tragedy, a death, a horrible problem that they can't overcome. And they start to get into God's Word to figure out how to manage the tragedy. And through that process, they discover that, you know what? What I once thought was a really cool book and a really good book has now become something more than a good book. It's become something more than I just casually read or casually look at on Sunday or casually uh, take into my life. It actually becomes the foundation of everything about my life. 
because it speaks about everything. It speaks about my relationship with God. It speaks about my relationship with a girlfriend, a fiance, or my wife. It speaks about my relationship with my kids. It speaks about work. It speaks about every area of life, my finances. And to get from here to here, people realized and internalized that God's Word is the all-important authority that drives everything in their life. That as soon as they have a problem, other than pray, they go right to the Word. How many of you go right to the Word when you have a problem to try and figure out what does God say about this? And there is something that He has to say. It may just be to encourage you. It may be just to strengthen you, to strengthen your faith, or your faith in the Psalms. It may be any number of different things, but God has some way to speak to your situation and where you are. These are people that are living out this reality. I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, I've done marriage counseling enough times to know one thing. That people, if I'm counseling a couple, we get to a point in the counseling where I say, look, where is God's word in your marriage? Because if God's word is not the final authority of your life, I can't help you anymore. If it is, I can help you. Because without that, as the cornerstone and the foundation, it doesn't matter what we do. We're not getting anywhere. We're going to spin our wheels. And the last group, to get from this group to this group, these people internalized and have understood something very, very critical. They understood giving. Now here's where the pastor talks about money. It's not where I talk about money. Giving is time, talent, and your treasure. It's a combination of all three. Lordship-driven people, God-centered people, have understood the reality of generous giving life through their time, through their talents and their abilities, and through what God blesses them with as their treasure. They've internalized it to the point where here's what that looks like. I'm not my own. I don't own me. God owns me. Everything I have is God's. I'm a God-centered person. And whatever God needs me to do or asks me to do with any of my time, any of my talents, and any of the treasure He gives me, I give it all away. That is being Christ-like. And this group of people are responsible for helping these people get here. Make no mistake. Because if you're producing 30, 60, and 100 fold, that tells me by the virtue of this principle that you have to be pouring back into these other groups to help them along. This is what we just don't see in church life. And I don't understand why we don't see it. Other than to say that as I read this and I'm delivering this to you, Satan comes and takes it away. And we let him. And we let him. See, Satan works in this world to kill everything that God wants to do. And by virtue of that, I want us to understand another thing about how this works with our prayer life real quick. These people rarely talk to God. Okay, if you're looking at it from that perspective. These people frequently talk to God. Okay? These people talk to God on a regular basis, quite often. These people are people that have a running conversation in their head with the God of the universe. Now, I can tell you where I am on this just based on how I pray, like how I function my day. I have a running conversation with God all day long. I can shut off any noise, filter out anything, and just stop and focus on what God wants me to focus on. And it may change the complexion of everything I do in that next moment. And that is a place you want to get to in your life because when you are driven 
and you are lordship driven and you are a God centered person, you are always in the exact place where God wants you to be at the exact time. Does that mean you're going to be 100% obedient, Sam, all the time? No. No. It means that you're tuned in to the eternal, the eternal God. You're tuned in to God's frequency. Okay? So, let's get to these three points. Here, make your notes. We'll get to the three points. They're not hard. They're simple. And if you are in the group the first group, and you are an exploring God person, and you're here today, and based on everything we just talked about through this parable, as we laid it out in the framework, we're going to move forward here, and if you find yourself here, here's three things that you need to think about, or that I'm going to speak directly to you. Number one, it's not based on works. Getting to the next place, finding Jesus, receiving salvation, is not based on anything you did. John 6, 28, Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. No matter what group you're in, Satan uses this area, and I would suggest that we make things so hard for people. Because this whole thing isn't based on works. Your whole salvation, receiving Christ isn't based on anything you did or anything you're going to do. It's not based on what I'm going to do five minutes from now. It's totally based on understanding God's grace and His love. And by that grace and by that love, you receive number two, which is what? His free gift of salvation. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ our Lord. Based on what Paul writes here, do you, do you get an idea or get an inclination that people that are working for their salvation are going to be in heaven? I'm just asking you your opinion. Because... Paul lays this out in a very specific way. The wages of sin is death. If you're a works-based person where you really think that based on what you do gets you something from God, your payment or your wage is death. The free gift of God through grace is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Big difference. There's a big difference between the two. And it's completely free. And Jesus paid for it completely. He didn't just make a down payment. He put a deposit in your account. And that deposit that Jesus put into your account, the Fred Kaysen account, is the full payment for me. Jesus made a deposit, inheritance, I received it. I am now his child. And I, I live forever. I have eternal life. I have eternal life through Jesus. It's simple. Can you all promise me one thing? Look at me. Never make this hard for anyone. Because why? Because the whole premise of my ministry is based on Isaiah 61. Preaching the good news to the poor and the oppressed. Why? For this reason. So that they may believe and have eternal life. Not that they got to come here and do something. That's not the case. People are stuck in this idea that you got to do something to get something. That's never what the Bible says. Don't ever make it hard. Don't make it hard for people to come to the cross. Don't make it hard for people to serve. Don't make it hard for people to plug in. Don't set yourself up to be the people that I can't be a Christian because they make it hard. It's not hard. It's the easiest thing any person could possibly ever do based on the fact that their eyes are open, they're hearing, and there's grace infused in it, and they receive it. 
and they can take it. Anybody can. There's more people sitting in their living rooms or in bed this morning than there is anywhere else. That's a problem, in my view, as a pastor, as just a Christian. Because I want them to be in a place where they're worshiping God, wherever that is. I don't care where that is. I hope that person's okay. But it's a free gift. And lastly, and most importantly, it's easy to receive. Romans 10.9, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's simple. It's easy. It's not hard. It's not hard. It's a free gift. God made it simple. Folks, if you find yourself in this group, what God's plan for you is, what God's desire for you is, is by the work of the Holy Spirit to move you into the next group. Now, if you're here and you find yourself in the beginning God stages, then you need to spend more time in God's Word. And you need to really dive in and ask God to reveal to you the things that you need to do to stay grounded in His Word and keep the Word seated in your heart and to keep it ever before you. I guarantee you there are saints in this room that could spit out scriptures by memory more than me. And I'm looking at all of you because you know who I'm talking about. That's keeping God's Word inside your heart so that the enemy can't come in and take it away. Every time I think about a situation at times, lately it seems that there's a scripture that goes along with it that just comes into my head. Why? Because it's in my heart. Because it's here. Because it's seated here. It's planted here on ground that Jesus continues to water. And when you are getting to a place, and many of you here, here today are here, because you've understood through by whatever means of grace that God's given you to understand by His Spirit, that your whole life is His. That anything He requires of your time, you give it. Anything He requires of a talent of yours and an ability of yours, you freely give it. Anything that he would, even though it's very difficult in the world we live in financially, even if he moves on your heart to give in some measure of finance, you give it. Because it's those people that are God-centered, that produce fruit, that keeps with repentance, not works, that keeps himself alive in the Spirit, where they produce 30, 60, and some 100-fold more and they can't produce that without a continuous, God-centered, lordship-driven life and focus. So today, I mean, we're going to talk more about each one of these in the, in the weeks to come. So next time, we're going to talk more about what does this look like. We've made this journey. So can I ask right now, before we leave, is there anybody that's here that needs to make this journey? Is there anybody here that needs to make that journey? That needs to understand that it's nothing you did? Just raise your hand. Then I just want you to come up front because we're going to pray for you. And we're going to be dismissed. Andy, you can come and play if you want to throw your guitar on for a few minutes. Luke, you want to come? If you're here and God's worked in your heart to the point where you understand that God's gift of salvation is a free gift and you found yourself that you're an explorer and you want to be born again by the Spirit of God, then I'm just going to pray for you while Andy plays. And then I'm going to pray for all of us and we're going to move forward. And I pray, and my prayer for all of you is that you continue on your journey by continuing to be infused with God's Word. There's a lot of things you could listen to. There's a lot of religious systems that spew a lot of stuff. What am I going to tell you to do? Same thing that all of you know I'm going to tell you to do. Go, read this. This is what I follow. This is what I preach. I don't preach denominational doctrine. I preach God's Word because that's the only thing fruitful for salvation, sanctification, and living life that God wants you to live. 
don't get me wrong, I think denominations have their place. But at the end of the day, it's God's word through his spirit that does the work in man, that does the work in the world. So as I pray, Luke, would you come over here? I want to pray with I'm gonna pray with Jim. Come in here over here and pray. Uh, we're just gonna take a time. You all can bow your heads while I pray with Jim and while Luke prays. Uh, with Wendy and Donovan, and maybe you still want to join us. Maybe God, as we're praying, is going to move on your heart, and you just need prayer for something. Maybe you don't need prayer for salvation. Maybe you're in the next group already. Maybe you've received Christ into your heart. That's awesome. Maybe you're in the Lordship category, and you have a struggle, and you just want prayed for. So come and get prayed for. And as you see other people come, come and pray for them, Sam. Sharon, where are you at? Upstairs today. So she's not here. One of the other board of directors or overseers or, you know what, come and pray with them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I just pray with Brother Jim, Lord, that today he receives your free gift of grace, receiving your son, receiving the fullness of his spirit coming through the cross. That's nothing that Jim ever did, Lord, as he comes to you. But we thank you for saving him. We praise you for saving him. And I would just ask Jim, just pray this in your heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. I just come to you knowing that I'm a sinner, that it's by nothing that I've done, that you love me, that you receive me, that you make me brand new right now today. And Lord, that I love you and I will follow you all of my days. You paid it all. You gave it all. And Lord, I just pray the blessings of heaven on Jim. As he goes on this journey, Lord, you're going to take him to amazing places in his own personal life, in his marriage. And Father, we rejoice with joy. We receive with joy the word that you spoke here today that moved this wonderful man from one place to the next place. May you continue to infuse him by the power of your spirit. God's blessing. Jesus Christ, Jim said. Amen. Amen. Brother. You can stay or sit down. That's fine. Anybody else needs prayer for anything, please feel free to come. Spend some quiet time up here in reflection yourself. Speak to God. Let Him move in your heart. Follow up with somebody today. Follow up with somebody this week. Connect with somebody. We learned about this first group, people that are exploring God. And what's the key thing, the key principle? The Word gets spoken into their life. They receive it. Oh, you ever receive a revelation or some enlightening thing from God and go, wow, I never realized that. God's speaking to me. And as soon as they get in the parking lot, Satan comes and takes it away. And they're right back to the same place that they were. There's nothing more that the enemy loves than to come and steal the things that God puts in people's hearts, that he lays on people's mind. God loves people. And Satan is his enemy. So to say that Satan hates, Satan hates people, yeah, he hates you. He hates you enough to want to kill everything about you and send you to hell. I don't think that's too loving. Anybody agree? That's not a loving thing. So as we leave, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray for anyone who has come into this place today 
that you fill them, sanctify them through and through. May your love be poured out upon them, your grace be poured out upon them this week in every place that they go. And Lord, the people that have made decisions today, we pray blessings upon those decisions that you would give your people the power to follow up and encourage and pray and keep that word seated so that it may grow, so that it may fall and grow deeper and get deeper into better soil where the word is received, that people understand on a deep level, open their spiritual eyes, open their spiritual ears so they can understand things, things that you want them to understand, the mysteries of heaven and the kingdom of God to be brought here on this earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray for everyone here. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, and amen. So we'll pick this back up on the 23rd.